We left off in the book of John in the fifth chapter with Jesus healing a man who had been uh, paralyzed, you know, disabled for at least 38 years. He was trying desperately to get into the pool of Bethesda in order to be healed of that which he had. And, and Jesus uh, inquires of him, do you want to be healed? And he did. And he did. And uh, he went away, he picks up his bed, he goes away and he walks and immediately he is uh, accosted by those uh, uh, righteous people and uh, they're upset with him because he's carrying his bed on the Sabbath day. And he says, well, that's what the man told me to do. The man who healed me told me to do and I did it. And so right off the bat, the scribes, the Pharisees, the righteous people, the, the professional church people uh, immediately want to go after the teacher. And uh, so we left, after, uh, left off from that on uh, the 15th verse, and we're going to take up on the 16th verse. Lord, I pray that you would enlighten us. There's so many important things in this uh, and these words that John wrote down for us. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to understand, help us to get a glimpse of how great and how wonderful you are. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would put that deep in our hearts. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so from that point on, the Jews decided that they would persecute Jesus, he says in the 16th verse, and they sought to slay him. I'm always amazed at uh, uh, people who are, you know, really intense. And we're seeing it right now in the political uh, arena in America today, the, the great intensity, such a huge divide. And the, the way people want to reach out in violence against those that uh, have a, a different point of view than they do. And uh, this is especially uh, true in the Middle East, on all things religion, my goodness, Islam just wants to kill just about everybody. They, they hate us. They hate themselves. They hate their neighbors. And, and uh, it's all about killing, doing whatever they do, and see how many people that they can kill. That right off the bat should give you a, a hint that this is certainly nothing from God. And if we are so stirred up in our personal lives on a political uh, level, you might want to take a, a, a check there also. We don't want to be hateful uh, towards people who differ from us. But this is certainly the case here, and we see that nothing has changed in 2,000 years. The, the attitude is still the same in the Middle East. It says we don't agree with him, kill him, kill him. But were they really um, that... Uh, that far off in, in wanting to uh, uh, kill him. Uh, see if I can pull this up. I should have had this pulled up to begin with. And I did not, because I wanted to uh, uh, take you to uh, Exodus uh, chapter 35 in the second verse. It says, six days shall work be done. But on the seventh day, there shall be to you an holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. That seems very, very harsh. But there is an important lesson that's to be learned uh, here. Uh, we know that everything is done to teach us something. And even from the very beginning, there's a lesson where we are given glimpses of, of God so that we might understand him and understand his heart and understand his intents toward us and un for us to understand the consequences of the decisions that we make. And so he set a very high bar at that beginning point concerning the Sabbath. But yet he points out later, Jesus himself points out, in, in Mark, the second chapter, the 27th verse, and he said unto them, 
the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So there's an important lesson. And of course, I, in a previous teaching, I talked about what the purpose of the Sabbath was also. This is a, a very important lesson to be learned. So we go to Hebrews, the fourth chapter, and the ninth through the eleventh verses says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Key word there, unbelief. So we need to enter into a rest. And that is a rest from trying to make ourselves right with God. We cannot do it. It's not within our power. There are so many things that we take upon ourselves uh, not realizing that it's just not within our power. I think the foolishness today that there is such a great group of people, and if you're one of these, then I, I hope that you'll just uh, take my derision with gra grace. <laughs> this great group of people who think that we can control the climate. <laughs> no, uh, the, the arrogance of that, that measly little old man, think that we can control the climate, especially when the only solution for controlling the climate is to take money from you and I. <laughs> and that somehow is going to change the climate. So uh, we need to stop from our laboring of trying to make ourselves right with God. And it's placed deep within us in our nature to want to earn our way for the most part. We, we like to earn our way, and we're reluctant to take the hand out. And a lot of times we, we resist the help when it's offered. But sometimes we need to. And then this is one of those cases where we need to, because that's what the Sabbath is all about. There is in the scripture um, and, and in nature and just everything about us, all of these analogies that point to God. And his relationship to us, relationship with the church. You remember from Ephesians when we study about the relationships of men and women, how we should treat one another in the marriage. And when, uh, when Paul gets to the end of that teaching, he has a conclusion that he comes to. He says, this is a great mystery. This is a great mystery. And um, he says, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And so the marriage relationship stands for something else. See, there's so many things that are this way. And we should be looking for those. We should look for them uh, around us in nature. We should look for it in the scripture. We should look for the analogies that point to Christ in our own lives and in the things that we do. I'd spoke of the intentionality. Jesus had intentionality as he went. We should do the same. Years ago, when I was in high school, 1965, back then, 8th Street in Bend that runs on the west side of Pilot Butte, that was the outskirts of town. That was the very edge of town. And if you went way off, right to the edge of the earth, right where it drops off, <laughs> you went out past the Bend Airport, and Clyde Purcell built the first planned community and first subdivision that was done by one man in Central Oregon. It was called Cimarron City. And it was so far out of town that it took forever for, and for people to go out. The only reason people would go out there is because they could buy a cheap house. And so the contractors went out there and they built some of the cheapest, junkiest houses that you could imagine. They cut as many corners as they could. And, uh, and those houses, uh, you know, they, they built them and they just started deteriorating over time. And I purchased one of those deteriorating houses. And I know everything was substandard on it. The, the outside siding was three-eighths of an inch thick. <laughs> it's like masonite. Anyway, uh, the house was spent. And you know how life is, especially when you start getting to where your hair is my color. 
and everything is kind of breaking down and we slow down and we can't lift as much as we could and all that. You know, I went out this morning and I helped uh, Ken and Vicky's son, Timothy, clear out his work uh, shed that he had to do. And there were a couple of times I had to say, well, Timmy, this is more than I can handle. You're going to have to come help me on this one <laughs> and, and because I just can't pack the heavy stuff like I used to do when I was, was younger. And those houses were no different than that. They were deteriorating, going bad, you know. And the one we found, the people were trying to bring it back. They had hauled off the garbage that had accumulated on the property, and they were, they painted the house a nice, attractive pink. And and the inside of the house, they had painted all the walls uh, 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 enamel white, bright enamel white, without doing any of the repairs. So it just made all the imperfections of the walls just stand out and uh, they were they were trying their best and uh, and I told them well I'll buy it if you'll stop remodeling I'll <laughs> I'll pay you full price just stop remodeling <laughs> and, and they did and you know we worked on that and we worked on it we worked on it and when I got done everybody thought that was a new house and everybody came out to that house they really liked it we turned it from the worst house in the neighborhood into one of the best houses in the neighborhood and we transformed the property that was all around and I like to tell people when they'd come and they'd see it and they just loved it and everybody, everybody liked that house. I liked that house. I thought it was going to be my last house. I was wrong. Never say never. And, but I would tell people, this house is very much like the Lord Jesus Christ because he can take a life that has been totally wasted and worn down and practically destroyed, and everybody looks at that life and they say, this thing is only worth being shoveled down. And just, just do away with it. And he can take it and make it something that is attractive and beautiful. And that's what we need to do in our lives. That's why I like to fix old things up and to polish them and keep them clean and all that. Is because it's analogous of what the Lord Jesus Christ does for us on an individual basis. And so we should be looking for those analogies. And then Jesus answered them and he said, My father worketh here hitherto, and I work. He's talking to these self righteous leaders, these people who are exercising their control over those that are a part of their flock. They're the ones who tell people what to do and how to do it. They're the ones better educated and therefore know better how you ought to live your life. And he looks at these self-righteous people who can't see the beam that is in their own eye. And he says, my father works and I work. In six days, in six days, God Almighty created everything in the universe, all of it, through the word, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, everything was created in six days. And on the seventh day, he rested from his work. Do you suppose he did that because he was tired? Do you think he was just worn out? Do you think that he had aged so much in those six days that he could no longer lift another planet? I don't think so. He only did it for one reason. That you and I would come to understand at some point in the future that we need to rest from our labors of trying to make ourselves righteous before God because it is not possible. Only he can do that. Only he can do that. And so, the Pharisees had a second thing against Jesus. Because not only did he work on the Sabbath day, and he just continually wanted to do this. I mean, the nerve of this guy. He's actually healing people on the Sabbath day, of all things. But now, he has had the audacity to say that my father works and I work. He has made himself equal with God. It says, therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him. Before, they just wanted to slay him. Now they want to kill him. 
in the Greek, it's the same word. Because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but he said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. My father worketh here to, hitherto, and I work. Do you suppose that somewhere in their searching the scriptures, they just kind of skipped over uh, Psalm 121, verses 3 and 4? He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Mm. He doesn't do it. He designed us so that we need to sleep. We actually need to sleep because that is the time that the brain flushes out the impurities. Sometimes they go out as a nightmare. <laughs> but we need it. We need our sleep. And now I understand in my old age, slumber and sleep. I'm reading something and I start to nod off. <laughs> or I'm watching even a program sometimes and think, huh, I think I'll just <laughs> I think I'll just tune out of this. I can pick this up later. And then other times. This morning, 3.30 in the morning, and boing. And then I wanted to sleep, and I couldn't sleep. But God doesn't need either one. And he is always at work. He is always maintaining. It says that everything in this world is held together by the power of Jesus' word. He is paying attention to every little thing. And he is always there. Never slumber. Never sleep. It says, then answered Jesus, and he said unto them, and I titled this message, Verily, Verily. Amen, Amen. Amen and Amen. I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. Now they've been following him around for months we're uh, probably most of the way through the first year of Jesus' ministry by the time we get to this stage of the fifth chapter. Uh, and so they've been following him around. And all this time, we know that he has done so much stuff. I mean, people are coming to him in throngs. And we, he, every now and then, they mention some notable healing that's going on. But it's not just one healing that's going on. There's hundreds of healings going on. Maybe even thousands. People are coming to him with all kinds of aches and pains because as you know and I know, we have aches and pains. And what do we want more than anything? To be rid of those aches and pains. And the people that followed him, they got to feel the warmth of the graciousness of his touch and feel the aches and pains just leave their bodies. And they marveled at the things that he did and the things that he taught. And meanwhile, the powers that be are saying, this is cutting into our territory. You know what? People are following him. They're starting to go to his church and not to ours. Our baskets are not as full. People aren't paying as much attention to us. Why, you know, I actually went out and I stood on the street corner and prayed and hardly anybody took note of the marvelous things that I said to God. And so they want to kill him. They're looking for these ways. And he looks him in the eye and he tells him, the Father and I are this close. God is the author of love. You know that? You know, we experience it at the highest level 
uh, of creation. I think that there are other animals that that uh, get these bond attachments. Some we know are more than others. We know that there are some animals like uh, geese, for one, that mate for life. And once they are mated, that's it. And, uh, and so there has to be an attachment, a strong attachment there. And we all have had pets, dogs, cats, or whatever. And, well, not so much cats, but dogs are devoted to us and, and, and love us and everything else. Cats tolerate us and utilize us as staff. But uh, the, we do know that some animals, but on the human level, the peak of God's creation, See, unlike what we're taught today in the schools and everything else, that mankind is the scourge of the earth that's ruining all the environment that everywhere is. Au contraire. Mankind is the peak of God's creation. He is, we are the very reason that he made this planet. He didn't do it for the dinosaurs. They're gone. They didn't need to last this long. But we're still here because he loves us and he maintains us and he provides for us. And he's, he's doing something on a big level that someday we will understand when we are at his, at his feet in heaven. But he has placed within our hearts the capacity to love. That is a, a very strong emotion. And we experience it in, at the, the best in the tight bonds of a relationship, the relationship of a man and a wife, and then the relationship of a family. The bond between a child and a parent is strong. And I can tell you the bond between a grandparent and a grandchild is exceptionally strong. It's why we make the effort twice a year and the expense and have for the last 15 years to go twice a year to my crazy son who chose to live on the other side of the United States so that we can have that input into the lives of our grandchildren. And they can know us and they can know our faith and they can know our love and our, our concern for them. And they can have a, an anchor point back in history that this is how it was in my grandparents' day. Maybe it should be something like this in my day. And so he's placed within our hearts his ability to have this bond, and he makes it clear that this is the bond that he has with the Father. It is unbreakable. And we all know and have experienced that kind of a bond with their very own children. Even when we have children who are wayward, it doesn't change the fact that they are our child and we love them. And we would bring them back if we can. And we seek to do that. But that bond of parent to child to grandchild is a gift of God. A gift of God. Just as a blessing to us. Because you think of all the blessings that it brings to your life to experience Love at the best level. And we hardly begin to understand it, uh, and, and we only really understand it in the, in the context of Christianity to understand what agape love is. You know, the, the Greek has all these different levels of love. They're all translated as love, but it, they're different kinds, you know, brotherly love and, and sexual love. And, and, but this agape love is the apex. This is the kind of love that you give your life for somebody else. And that is what the father and the son has. And then he reveals something else. God Almighty, who created heaven and earth, Jesus by the, the voice of his command created all that is about us in, in all of its wonder. And then he comes and reduces himself to the same limitations that you and I have. He came into this world the same way that you and I did, and he left the first time the same way that you and I did. 
under very gruesome circumstances, but he gave up the ghost, and his body was dead. And we know that we have an understanding this is the way life is. We know that it has a beginning, and once we get out of our 20s, we realize it has an end. <laughs> and as we get to this stage of life, we realize the end is coming, and sometimes when we get close to the end, we welcome it. We say, please, Lord Jesus, take me home. Take me home. And I th can think of the number of times I have sat in years past with people in the nursing home and prayed, Lord Jesus, could this be the day? Please, give them release, take them home. And it becomes a good thing. And we're going to talk about that as we get a little further into this, into this verse, if I ever get there. So he's saying that he has all of these limitations, and as he's in this limited body that he now finds himself, that he has confined himself uh, uh, purposefully in. And, gosh, if I can get this thing to stop bouncing around here. Uh, he uh, is saying, he's saying a truth, a spiritual truth here. He's saying the son can do nothing of himself. So at that limited way that he was in the human body that he had, He's saying, these things that I'm doing, I can't do as just a man. I can do it because of what my father is providing me with. So there's a good thing for us to write down in our notes or whatever and, and strike this down that maybe there's an example here for you and I. And he says, uh, for the father, uh, it says, for the father, uh, he says, I'm going to show you greater works than what I've done up to now. Verily, verily, I say to you, I'm going to do greater works than these that ye may marvel. You're going to look at this and go, my goodness, this is just unbelievable. Uh, I don't know how I can get this to, <laughs> I've got something that's popping up right in the middle of my screen and I, I can't get it to go away. And if I, and it, it will not go away. <laughs> I'll have to try to work around it if I can. So this is a, this is exceedingly annoying. Pardon me, what? No, I know I know where I am uh, in the in the verse. I just the thing is right in the middle of my screen and. And so I'm having to work around it, this. Uh, he says, um, uh, I do this at you may marvel, for as the Father raises up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. Now, stepping back just a, a bit to where he said the Son can do nothing of himself. I want to jump forward in the book of John into the uh, 15th chapter in the fourth verse and he says I am the vine ye are the branches he that abideth in me and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit for without me ye can do nothing So there's a spiritual truth here, something that we need to apply to our own life. Stop trying to do things in our own power and open ourselves up saying, Lord Jesus, what will you do through my life? How can you minister through me? How can you have an effect in the things that I do? And in that way, we gain that same intentionality that Jesus had. And that connectedness that is so necessary. And it says, so the Father raises up the dead and he quickeneth them. Uh, uh, he uh, quickeneth them even so. And the Son quickeneth whom he will. Quickeneth, quickeneth. <coughs> Zoapoye. Zoapoye. And uh, uh, zoan, 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 I guess how it's said, is, means an animal, 
a live creature. That's where we get the word zoo. We go to the zoo because it's all animals. We study zoology, which is studying animals and all. And so this zoopoi, uh, zoopoieo, zoopoieo, there we go, zoopoieo, get it right. It's from the, the same root word, uh, the zo and the, the uh, poeo part of it, very similar to poema comes from the same root word and you remember Jesus said that we are his poema his workmanship so uh, that's this kind of the same idea this this making alive bringing something back to life making it and and the King James re uh, renders it as quicken to bring it in make it alive so he says that God has his power to do that and he said the son has that same power too. And up to this point, he hasn't demonstrated it. But he's going to talk about it a little bit. It says, for the father judgeth no man. So God has placed a certain authority onto Jesus, both in his earthly life and as his manifestation of God as the son. He is the one who has judging power. It says, for God, the Father judgeth no man. Our Father is a good Father. Or as the song says, a good, good Father. The people who think that God is just an angry old man up there trying to zap them with a lightning bolt uh, have really got a, a, an improper view of God. Scripture makes it plain that God is love. But there has to be judgment. There has to be. And that falls within the purview of Jesus Christ. So he, he says this, uh, hath committed all judgment unto the Son that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. This is one of the ways you can judge uh, if someone's teaching properly or not. There are a lot of people out there who gather to themselves, congregations, people, and would lead you to believe that Jesus was indeed a great prophet and a good teacher and this, that, and the other but not the Son of God. And Jesus makes it very clear that all men should honor the Son. He's making it very, very exclusive. There's a lot of people don't like that. They want to be more inclusive. That's the word of the, of the decade, right? Inclusive. And uh, so we want to be able to bring everybody in. And so you don't believe that you should change your lifestyle. Not a problem. You come on, come in here. You know, and, oh, you don't have to believe that, you know, Jesus. You don't have to believe that they did this in six days. You know, you don't have to believe this, that, and the other. Pick and choose, pick and choose, pick and choose. And Jesus said that if you don't honor the Son, you're not honoring the Father. Very exclusive. That's why later on he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except by me. That's it. The one and only person in all of human history, and he is the only way into eternal life. Makes it very hard, and I'm glad that I don't have to sort it all out. He's the one that's going to sort it all out. But I know this. That if you do not honor the Son, you're not honoring God, and you might as well not bother at all. Verily, verily, amen, amen, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Present. Ever present tense. 
is passed from death to life. He that heareth my word and believeth on him, that is Jesus, believeth on God that sent me, believe on Jesus, if you do that, you have everlasting life. This is a key verse. Some of those times when you think, oh my goodness, I failed again. What should I ever do? You know, I'm not worthy and blah, 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 blah. Well, that's true. You're not worthy. But God made you worthy. And so now you're worthy. And so this is a key verse. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So there is condemnation if you don't believe you hear and you don't believe you reject there's condemnation and it isn't Jesus that condemned you because he gave his very life that you might be saved you have condemned yourself because you haven't believed on him whom he sent very important verse There's going to be condemnation, and it's going to be tough. You know, in the 15th chapter of John, or, uh, pardon me, uh, in the, I'm sorry, I, not the 15th chapter, but uh, Luke, the 10th chapter, when he talks about judgment, and it's in the purview of, of Jesus to do this. Uh, he told his disciples, go out. He sent 70 disciples out one time. He told them, go into the cities and you preach the word and you stay in people's houses or whatever. And if people accept it, you give them the blessing because God has come nigh to them. And he says, but if they reject your message, he says, then uh, he's, he starts at the 10th verse there of Luke 10. He says, but into whatsoever city ye enter and you receive you not, go your ways out into the streets of the same and say, even the very dust of your city, which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you, and I say unto you that I shall be more tolerable in that day for Sodom. It shall be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. My goodness. The depravity of Sodom and Gomorrah got so bad that God rained sulfur and you know, brimstone on them. Which is an inter interesting side note. Is, you, know, you go to that area today and you dig it up. And all around Sodom and Gomorrah are these baseball chunks of sulfur that you can light on fire even today. They're still there. And there's nothing left of the civilization or the towns that were there. But when you go to Zoar, remember that's where Lot got to? Nothing there. It only fell on Sodom and Gomorrah, not on this little town. It would be better for Sodom than for that city. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works that have been done in Tyre and Sidon, which have been done in you, they had a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, which are exalted to heaven, shall be thrust down to hell. He that heareth you heareth me, and he that despiseth you despiseth me, and he that despiseth me despiseth him that sent me. So there is going to be judgment. Verily, verily, I say unto you, amen, amen, I say unto you, verse 25, the hour is coming and now is. When the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. 
mentioned it twice in two verses, that God, Jesus has the authority of judgment. But the important part here is that God is the author of life. He's the author of love. He's the author of life. And he is so strong in the author that just by his word, everything came to life. Just look about us in the world that we have. Life is everywhere. And because of that, when he, in his creation, he has established certain laws that are immutable. And one of those laws is the law of biogenesis. Only life can beget life. And lo and behold, from our study of genetics and all that we know at this point in time, we know that Darwin was just full of beans because it is just exactly the way the Bible said. He created each thing after its kind, and it can only reproduce after its kind. And it's an amazing thing. Life is an amazing thing. And it's so fragile. You know, in just a moment, it can be taken away. You ever think of it, you know, the, of those who die in accidents, you know, and you could, if you could only back up just 15 seconds, you know, just a little bit, and then it's gone instantly. So life begets life, and that life is in God Almighty and in Jesus Christ himself. He says that God has this ability. He's got it. The Father hath life in himself, and so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. So that at that point that he gave his life up willingly, he says, it's finished, and then he gave up spirit he left his carcass behind they drag it off they put it in a tomb but he had life in himself and had the power to bring it back into a thoroughly dead body a body that by the third day would be decaying because the minute the life is gone out of our body all those little bugs that we have in our body and boy it's disturbing to realize how many bugs that we have in our body Inside, outside, you know, they're just crawling. You know, they say there's all these little lice you can't even see that are on your eyelids and everything else, you know. You guys are going to itch for the rest of the night. <laughs> but the minute that, that spark of life has gone out of this temporary tent that we have, the bugs start eating it. It decays away. They make a great science of that, too. You know, they have these... Uh, places they have kind of fields if you dedicate your body to science they can take you out there and just leave you in the field and then they watch and see what comes to eat you first and you know how many days it takes and all that kind of, and so now because of this forensic science they can uh, find a body and they can tell by the degree of decay just exactly how many days it's been that way I don't think I want that job So he has this life that's in himself. And then he says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. I can of my own self do nothing, as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. The time is coming when the graves shall hear his voice. And later on, as we get into this book, and as we read through the Gospels, the accounts, you think of that, the times that he raised from the dead. Now, I've often heard the illustration that when he went to Lazarus' tomb, you know, Lazarus had been gone, and his sister says, oh, Lord, he stinks by now. We don't, want to, we don't want to open up that tomb. 
And what did he do? He yelled, Lazarus, come forth. Because if he had just said, come forth, they would have all got up and come out. And the time will come that he will bring everybody out. I do not understand the intricacies of it because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We know that a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day to God. So time is meaningless to him. The physicalities of everything is meaningless to God. (coughs) Jesus came back. He walked through the walls. You know, and yet his body was the same body as yours and mine. I don't know how he does all this stuff. I don't know how he brings it all together, but I know he has the ability to do that. Again, one of the laws that we know of science, of physics, is the conservation of energy, that nothing goes away. It's just changed from one thing into another. I have heard people speak out against being cremated. That's just not the right thing to do and I disagree with them because if you're going to apply that logic then so if somebody burns up in a building then they're going to lose their place in heaven I don't think the Bible says that in fact I think the Bible just said that if I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that I I have passed from death to life already I am presently, even before my death, I'm already passed into that next life. I've often wondered if we all arrive at the same time. Could be. We look at time as a timeline, you know, and maybe if you turn that timeline like this, it's a circle, and God is in the middle of that circle, and we all get there at the same time. I don't know. It's as good a crackpot idea as anybody else's. Yeah. And so there is going to come that time when he speaks the word and the graves will open up. Now, all of those graves are full of the decayed bones and the flesh is all gone and everything else. But he who has the ability to go out into the valley of the dry bones and to bring them together and form an army has the ability to pull us back from wherever we are because he who knows every hair on my head knows every molecule in the universe. The one whose thoughts towards me are like the sand of the sea. One who can keep track of such infinite detail is going to be able to pull back every molecule of me and put me back together. That's going to be pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. So don't worry about what happens to the carcass. He can pull it all back and put it all back to just the way. I hope he puts it back better. Might be nice if he put me back at, you know, like 25. (laughs) Let's hope for that, okay? Let's hope for that. The graves will hear his voice. And let's hope that it's very, very soon. And the trumpet blows on Rosh Hashanah, and he says, come up here. And in the twinkling of eye, we're all changed, but those who are dead in Christ, they precede us. And we all get there at the glorious supper of the Lamb. The wedding feast will be wonderful. And everybody's going to come out of the grave. The good, the bad, and the ugly are coming out of the grave wherever they are. And we're all going to stand before God. I believe there's a division. He says, you sheep, you get over on this side. And we're not going to spend very much time with you. A few thousand years at the most. Because you're mine. And you've already passed into life. Now, I've got a few rewards to hand out for you, but you're mine. And then there's the goats, and this may take a while. And we can only hope that the word goes out, and miraculously, one more goat.
becomes a sheep. That's the goal. Goats to sheep. So that they come to a resurrection of life rather than the resurrection of condemnation. Or as he said, damnation. And then he gives us the final example in this verse, and I think this is what we take home tonight. Take this away. He says, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Oh, Lord, we are so happy. We are so blessed that you did all this, that you became one of us, that we might know that you know everything we think and feel and say and hear and do. You have full understanding of our frailties, and yet in your infinite love, you redeemed us into life evermore. What a marvelous thing. And so I pray, Lord, that each one of us would be able to, in some small way this week, start applying and, and being able to say, oh, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. We want to do the will of the Father. Line us up, Lord, with your will. Lord, we praise you tonight, and we thank you for bringing us together, and we thank you for the bond of love that only you can create. We appreciate you, and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.